Reply to the address of welcome at Parmakudi. Parmakudi was the first stopping place after leaving Ramnad, and there was a demonstration on a large scale, including the presentation of the following address. Srimat Vivekananda Swami We, the citizens of Parmakudi, respectfully beg to accord Your Holiness a most hearty welcome to this place after your successful spiritual campaign of nearly four years in the Western world. We share with our countrymen the feelings of joy and pride at the philanthropy which prompted you to attend the Parliament of Religions held at Chicago and lay before the representatives of the religious world the sacred but hidden treasures of our ancient land. You have by your wide exposition of the sacred truths contained in the Vedic literature disabused the enlightened minds of the West of the prejudices entertained by them against our ancient faith and convinced them of its universality and adaptability for intellects of all shades and in all ages. The presence amongst us of your Western disciples is proof positive that your religious teachings have not only been understood in theory, but have also borne practical fruits. The magnetic influence of your august person reminds us of our ancient holy rishis whose realization of the self by asceticism and self-control made them the true guides and preceptors of the human race. In conclusion, we most earnestly pray to the All-Merciful that Your Holiness may long be spared to continue to bless and spiritualist the whole of mankind. With best regards, we beg to subscribe ourselves. Your Holiness most obedient and devoted disciples and servants. In the course of His reply the Swami said, It is almost impossible to express my thanks for the kindness and cordiality with which you have received me. But if I may be permitted to say so, I will add that my love for my country, and especially for my countrymen, will be the same whether they receive me with the utmost cordiality or spurn me from the country. For in the Gita Shri Krishna says, Men should work for work's sake only, and love for love's sake. The work that has been done by me in the Western world has been very little. There is no one present here who could not have done a hundred times more work in the West than has been done by me. And I am anxiously waiting for the day when mighty minds will arise, gigantic spiritual minds, who will be ready to go forth from India to the ends of the world to teach spirituality and renunciation, those ideas which have come from the forests of India and belong to Indian soil alone. There come periods in the history of the human race when, as it were, whole nations are seized with a sort of world weariness, when they find that all their plans are slipping between their fingers, that old institutions and systems are crumbling into dust, that their hopes are all blighted and everything seems to be out of joint. Two attempts have been made in the world to found social life, the one was upon religion, and the other was upon social necessity. The one was founded upon spirituality, the other upon materialism, the one upon transcendentalism, the other upon realism. The one looks beyond the horizon of this little material world and is bold enough to begin life there, even apart from the other. The other, the second, is content to take its stand on the things of the world and expects to find a firm footing there. Curiously enough, it seems that at times the spiritual side prevails and then the materialistic side in wave-like motions following each other. In the same country there will be different tides. At one time the full flood of materialistic ideas prevails and everything in this life, prosperity, the education which procures more pleasures, more food, will become glorious at first and then that will degrade and degenerate. Along with the prosperity will rise to white heat all the inborn jealousies and haters of the human race. Competition and merciless cruelty will be the watchword of the day. To quote a very commonplace and not very elegant English proverb, everyone for himself and the devil take the hindmost, becomes the motto of the day. Then people think that the whole scheme of life is a failure. 
and the world would be destroyed had not spirituality come to the rescue and lent a helping hand to the sinking world. Then the world gets new hope and finds a new basis for a new building and another wave of spirituality comes, which in time again declines. As a rule, spirituality brings a class of men who lay exclusive claim to the special powers of the world. The immediate effect of this is a reaction towards materialism, which opens the door to scores of exclusive claims until the time comes when not only all the spiritual powers of the race, but all its material powers and privileges are centered in the hands of a very few, and these few, standing on the necks of the masses of the people, want to rule them. Then society has to help itself, and materialism comes to the rescue. If you look at India, our motherland, you will see that the same thing is going on now. That you are here today to welcome one who went to Europe to preach Vedanta would have been impossible had not the materialism of Europe opened the way for it. Materialism has come to the rescue of India in a certain sense by throwing open the doors of life to everyone, by destroying the exclusive privileges of caste, by opening up to discussion the inestimable treasures which were hidden away in the hands of a very few who have even lost the use of them. Half has been stolen and lost, and the other half which remains is in the hands of men who, like dogs in the manger, do not eat themselves and will not allow others to do so. On the other hand, the political systems that we are struggling for in India have been in Europe for ages, have been tried for centuries and have been found wanting. One after another, the institutions, systems and everything connected with political government have been condemned as useless and Europe is restless, does not know where to turn. The material tyranny is tremendous. The wealth and power of a country are in the hands of a few men who do not work but manipulate the work of millions of human beings. By this power they can deluge the whole earth with blood. Religion and all things are under their feet, they rule and stand supreme. The western world is governed by a handful of Shylocks. All those things that you hear about, constitutional government, Freedom, liberty and parliaments are but jokes. The West is groaning under the tyranny of the Shylocks and the East is groaning under the tyranny of the priests. Each must keep the other in check. Do not think that one alone is to help the world. In this creation of the impartial Lord, He has made equal every particle in the universe. The worst, most demoniacal man has some virtues which the greatest saint has not, and the lowest worm may have certain things which the highest man has not. The poor laborer, who you think has so little enjoyment in life, has not your intellect, cannot understand the Vedanta philosophy and so forth, but compare your body with his, and you will see, his body is not so sensitive to pain as yours. If he gets severe cuts on his body, they heal up more quickly than yours would. His life is in the senses, and he enjoys there. His life also is one of equilibrium and balance, whether on the ground of materialism, or of intellect, or of spirituality, the compensation that is given by the Lord to everyone impartially is exactly the same. Therefore we must not think that we are the saviors of the world. We can teach the world a good many things and we can learn a good many things from it too. We can teach the world only what it is waiting for. The whole of Western civilization will crumble to pieces in the next fifty years if there is no spiritual foundation. It is hopeless and perfectly useless to attempt to govern mankind with the sword. You will find that the very centers from which such ideas as government by force sprang up are the very first centers to degrade and degenerate and crumble to pieces. Europe, the center of the manifestation of material energy, will crumble into dust within fifty years if she is not mindful to change her position 
to shift her ground and make spirituality the basis of her life. And what will save Europe is the religion of the Upanishads. Apart from the different sects, philosophies and scriptures, there is one underlying doctrine, the belief in the soul of man, the Atman common to all our sects, and that can change the whole tendency of the world. With Hindus, Jains and Buddhists, in fact everywhere in India, there is the idea of a spiritual soul which is the receptacle of all power. And you know full well that there is not one system of philosophy in India which teaches you that you can get power or purity or perfection from outside, but they all tell you that these are your birthright, your nature. Impurity is a mere superimposition under which your real nature has become hidden. But the real you is already perfect, already strong. You do not require any assistance to govern yourself, you are already self-restrained. The only difference is in knowing it or not knowing it. Therefore the one difficulty has been summed up in the word avidya. What makes the difference between God and man, between the saint and the sinner? Only ignorance. What is the difference between the highest man and the lowest worm that crawls under your feet? Ignorance. That makes all the difference. For inside that little crawling worm is lodged infinite power and knowledge and purity, the infinite divinity of God Himself. It is unmanifested, it will have to be manifested. This is the one great truth India has to teach to the world, because it is nowhere else. This is spirituality, the science of the soul. What makes a man stand up and work? Strength. Strength is goodness, weakness is sin. If there is one word that you find coming out like a bomb from the Upanishads, bursting like a bombshell upon masses of ignorance, it is the word fearlessness. And the only religion that ought to be taught is the religion of fearlessness. Either in this world or in the world of religion, it is true that fear is the sure cause of degradation and sin. It is fear that brings misery, fear that brings death, fear that breeds evil. And what causes fear? Ignorance of our own nature. Each of us is heir apparent to the emperor of emperors, are of the substance of God Himself. Nay, according to the Advait, we are God Himself though we have forgotten our own nature in thinking of ourselves as little men. We have fallen from that nature and thus made differences. I am a little better than you, or you than I, and so on. This idea of oneness is the great lesson India has to give, and mark you, when this is understood, it changes the whole aspect of things, because you look at the world through other eyes than you have been doing before. And this world is no more a battlefield where each soul is born to struggle with every other soul and the strongest gets the victory and the weakest goes to death. It becomes a playground where the Lord is playing like a child and we are His playmates, His fellow workers. This is only a play, however terrible, hideous and dangerous it may appear. We have mistaken its aspect. When we have known the nature of the soul, hope comes to the weakest, to the most degraded, to the most miserable sinner. Only, declares your Shastra, despair not. For you are the same whatever you do, and you cannot change your nature. Nature itself cannot destroy nature. Your nature is pure. It may be hidden for millions of aeons, but at last it will conquer and come out. Therefore the Advat brings hope to everyone and not despair. Its teaching is not through fear, it teaches, not of devils who are always on the watch to snatch you if you miss your footing, it has nothing to do with devils, but says that you have taken your fate in your own hands. Your own karma has manufactured for you this body, and nobody did it for you. The omnipresent Lord has been hidden through ignorance and the responsibility is on yourself. 
You have not to think that you were brought into the world without your choice and left in this most horrible place, but to know that you have yourself manufactured your body bit by bit just as you are doing it this very moment. You yourself eat, nobody eats for you. You assimilate what you eat, no one does it for you. You make blood and muscles and body out of the food, nobody does it for you. So you have done all the time. One link in a chain explains the infinite chain. If it is true for one moment that you manufacture your body, it is true for every moment that has been or will come. And all the responsibility of good and evil is on you. This is the great hope. What I have done, that I can undo. And at the same time our religion does not take away from mankind the mercy of the Lord. That is always there. On the other hand, He stands beside this tremendous current of good and evil. He the bondless, the ever merciful, is always ready to help us to the other shore, for His mercy is great and it always comes to the pure in heart. Your spirituality, in a certain sense, will have to form the basis of the new order of society. If I had more time, I could show you how the West has yet more to learn from some of the conclusions of the Advat, for in these days of materialistic science the ideal of the personal God does not count for much. But yet, even if a man has a very crude form of religion and wants temples and forms, he can have as many as he likes, if he wants a personal God to love, he can find here the noblest ideas of a personal God such as were never attained anywhere else in the world. If a man wants to be a rationalist and satisfy his reason, it is also here that he can find the most rational ideas of the impersonal.